I'll bet she passed her physical with honors. The Venus of Cyrene, approximately 400 BC. If the Greeks had a word for her, it certainly would mean in perfect physical shape. In perfect physical shape. Yes, that's what it takes to do the man-sized job you picked for yourselves when you volunteered. And that means more than just passing your enlistment physical. It means far more than gaining immunity from contagious diseases through inoculations and yearly booster shots. Yes, and far more than getting a clean bill of health and those monthly checkups. Those things you can take for granted as part of Army Medical Corps vigilance to protect your health. For your sickness might well undermine the health of the entire group. Open up. Report to sick call whenever you feel below par. But be reasonable. Don't go running to your medical officer for imaginary ailments. There's a world of difference between indulging yourself and being good to yourself. A world of difference between not being sick and feeling glowingly healthy. Especially when you're doing a job in the army. It's all the difference between dragging along in a negative, half-hearted way because your vitality is low and living and working dynamically in a state of positive well-being because you have a reserve of energy to fall back on. To help you achieve this, we're calling on a woman who has devoted her life to teaching women the principles and technique of body harmony, which increases one's effectiveness and attractiveness in every department of living. Miss Helen Matthews. This is the ideal average figure of the modern American woman. And note I said average. Did I hear someone say figures like that don't exist outside Hollywood and the art galleries? But they do. The physical proportions of this lovely body are the resulting neck, bust, waist, hip, arm, leg measurements of thousands of average American women, ages 16 to 40. And you'll be even more astonished when I tell you they correspond closely to hers. Now, I'm not saying that each of you can make yourself over in ten easy lessons to look like the Venus of Cyrene. But I am saying that you modern women have an advantage over this classic beauty. You have a head. If you use it and your muscles and a little self-discipline, you'll be surprised how much you personally can do to make yourself look better and work better and longer with less fatigue because you feel better. There's no mystery to it. Feeling better simmers down to following a few simple rules. It means paying more attention to nutrition. It means understanding and putting heart into planned exercise. It means getting sufficient and proper rest. Primarily, rest means sleep, sound sleep, health sleep, beauty sleep, which gives your body and mind a chance to recover from today's activities in order to prepare for tomorrow's. Did I forget to lock the files? Why hasn't Jim written? The Colonel's going to want that paper tomorrow. It won't be finished. Why can't I go to sleep? You're all tied up in knots. Don't fight so hard. Let go. Start with your arms and legs. And let your whole body go limp, gradually. You can't expect to sleep until you relax. Watch this silly little kitten. She could give us all some valuable pointers on the technique of relaxation. She knows how to relax naturally, but we may have to work for it. Relaxing completely like this will help you to go to sleep. It will also work wonders in renewing your daytime energy if you can find a few moments for it at midday. But there are other ways to renew your energy on the job. She's crying too hard and getting nowhere fast. Oh my, she spoiled another sheet. In a case like this, pause from your work for a moment. Relax that tension. Mm -hmm. 
In the case of the worker who uses her brawn, a change to less vigorous refresher activity will do the trick. In other words, slow down instead of letting down all at once. Learn how to save your energy by conserving your movements. Restore your energy through sleep. Renew it through relaxation. Save it by conserving your movements. One of the best ways, though, to prevent fatigue is to build strength within your own body and to master the knack of doing things called body mechanics. And you can only do that through exercise. When I speak of exercise, I don't mean any kind of exercise. I mean planned exercise, the kind that really produces results. It isn't easy. It's often tiresome. But it wears off those bulges and bumps. It puts your weight in the right places. It gives you an active, supple, and shapely body. Foundation garments have their place. But the best foundation garment in the world is right inside your own body, your muscles. Any foundation garment wears out with use. But your muscles do just the opposite. They gain snap and elasticity the more they are used. Proper exercise will save you the embarrassment of being called one of those attractive from the neck up girls. And I don't mean the intellectual type. <coughs> Consistent daily planned exercise can be all things to all people. It can put inches on the thin girl and fill her out. It can take inches off the fat girl and slim her down. It can reproportion the girl with the unsymmetrical figure so that her curves fall in the right places. Planned exercise can also aid the internal mechanism of the body by aiding in the prevention of constipation and menstrual distress. But it can't accomplish these miracles alone. Which brings me around to nutrition, perhaps the most important of the factors that keep you in perfect physical shape. Your army meals are carefully planned by expert dietitians and contain all the food elements necessary for a well-balanced diet. Take a look at this tray. There's protein for muscle building in the hamburger, although you get it in eggs and cheese as well as meat. There's starch for energy in the potatoes and bread. The sugar in the Fig Newton gives you more energy. Minerals and water in the vegetable, fruit and milk nourish blood and bones. As for those alphabetical vitamins, which are essential for the prevention of disease, they are generously represented in all army menus. Before we take it away, let's take one more look at the tray. It's both what you eat and how much that counts. And that brings us to the burning question of calories. A body is similar to a machine. It runs on fuel called calories. A calorie is a familiar and convenient name for the unit by which we measure the fuel value of the food we consume. In everything we do, these calories are used. Calories which are not used for activity are stored in the body as fat. Your weight depends on the balance between the calories you take in and the calories you need for your daily activities. If you consume more calories than you need, you gain weight. If you take in fewer calories than you need, you lose weight. If there's a perfect balance between calorie intake and calorie need, your weight remains constant. Surprised? Now you see how important it is to know the calorie count of the foods you eat. But you don't have to skimp at meals. Just cut out those between meal sweets. Next time, try fruit or fruit juices instead of that chopped malt. Think of your weight.
don't be misguided. Your age should not influence your weight very much, but the size of your frame does. Here is the correct calculation. Pardon this note of gloom, but stout people are more likely to develop chronic diseases than thin people. This is due to the extra burden on their vital organs. Not being able to make the grade is an extreme example of what happens to people who avoid proper rest, daily exercise, wholesome diet. But there's another more usual result of ignoring the ABCs of a sensible health regime. It's a condition common among GIs. It often appears very funny to the other fellow, but never to its victim. This thing has certainly got her worried. No results in three days. That's serious, isn't it? Well, not according to what the medical officer told me. It doesn't have to be a once-a-day habit, but it does have to be a habit. She goes at all hours of the day and night, but never two days in succession at the same time. She's swallowed half of that bottle in less than a week. How you doing? Hey, what's the big idea? Here. Try this. It'll do you more good. Since when did you consider yourself a health authority? Since I stopped concentrating on patent medicines and started concentrating on coming here at a regular time each day, and when I have more than a couple of seconds. I'm just passing on what the medical officer told me. Cut out all that junk you eat and go in for fresh vegetables and fruits. And drink lots of water. Come on now, since you've tried everything else, you might just as well try the easy way. Hey, come on, get going. You've got exactly five minutes before drill. I can't drill today. I'm unwell. Come on, get up and take a shower. You'll be all right. Shower? Are you insane? It's almost suicide at this time of the month. A 20th century girl still clinging to that lavender and old lace hokum about no activity, no bathing during menstruation. That's Victorian stuff. And so is the hush-hush about nerves and sensibilities during this period. Women are where they are today, you are where you are today, because women have learned to take it in their stride. And there are other silly superstitions concerning this perfectly normal function of the female body. There is out of place in modern life as the spinning wheel of a coach and four. But when I tell some women that menstruation is no excuse for absenteeism and self-coddling, they look quite hurt and bewildered, and start bombarding me with all sorts of questions. What if you have the cramps and have to go to bed? Isn't something wrong if your period doesn't come every 28 days? Is it abnormal if the amount of flow is always changing? Are we expected to suffer and still go about our business as usual when we have the curse? What are the best hygienic protections? How do you know when you're starting your menopause? Do the nerves always go to pieces during the menopause? Let's clear the fog once and for all by letting one of your own medical officers answer these questions but one at a time. First, I want to say that there's no need to consider menstruation a curse. It's just nature's way of ridding your body of its preparation for pregnancy. This whole process should take place as painlessly and as easily as digestion. The fact that it doesn't with some of you may be due to a variety of reasons. And that brings me to that question about cramps. If you'll notice the position of the uterus, between the rectum and the bladder, you'll realize that pressure on it from constipation will cause cramps and a heavy feeling in the abdomen. So will slack abdominal muscles. Good ways to relieve this feeling are physical activity and application of heat. They both stimulate circulation of blood and relax the muscles. There is as much difference within your body when your posture is good or poor as there is between these two piles of block.
when you stand and sit incorrectly, your abdominal organs are so crowded that they have no room to function efficiently. But when you stand and sit correctly, they assume their proper place and don't interfere with your natural functions. If your posture is good and your abdominal muscles firm, you will suffer less pain during menstruation. Now as to your question, is there something wrong if your menstrual periods don't come every 28 days? The normal menstrual period can easily vary between 22 and 40 days, though the usual time is 28 days. The duration of the flow usually lasts from four to five days, but there's no need for alarm if it lasts only two days or as long as eight days. These variations depend on the individual. The amount of flow also varies with the individual. With some women, it's only scant staining of a few pads for the entire period. For others, it's saturation of from six to eight pads a day. But profuse flow most generally takes place the first and second days. A radical change of climate can bring about irregularity in the menses. Women who move from tropical to winter climates find that they may begin skipping periods until they adjust themselves to their new environment. Again, changes in habits will also cause a great change in the amount of flow. This girl would stop worrying if she knew that her flow had increased some because she had changed from a sedentary to a physically active job. So you see, there are many causes for irregularities in the menses beside the obvious ones of pregnancy and menopause. If your periods are irregular, it's a good thing to go to the medical officer. The choice between the external pad and the tampon is a purely personal one and depends largely on what you find is a safer and more convenient protection for you. The tampon fits into the vagina in this fashion, but a tampon will be uncomfortable and irritating if the vagina is small or the menstrual flow heavy. In these cases, the external pad is far more satisfactory. Since the chance of body odors is greater at this time if you use sanitary pads, change them often and take frequent baths and use deodorants. And it isn't necessary to douche after your period or at any other time unless you've been advised to do so by your doctor. Artificial cleansing tends to destroy the body fluids that take care of this cleansing process naturally. How do you know when you're starting your menopause? The symptoms are much the same as those of adolescence. Nervousness, menstrual irregularities, circulatory disturbances, and unbalanced glands. But adolescence seems a wonderful period as we look back, doesn't it? So there's no reason why life still can't begin at 40. And it often does. I think many women would lose their fear of menopause if once they realize that menopause means only the end of their childbearing life. And not the end of their sexual life, their attractiveness, or their usefulness. Forward, march! So you see, there's no need to get excited about normal female functions. They're just a part of your life. You can always take them in your stride. There's one more thought I want to leave with you on this subject. Remarkable progress has been made in new therapeutic treatments for the physical and psychological disorders that occasionally accompany menopause. Today, no woman need ever again fear this period in her life. There's one common ailment which you shouldn't take in your stride. If you do, your co-workers have every right to consider you public enemy number one. <coughs> this lady is spreading millions of cold germs and exposing all these young trainees and the instructor to possible cold infection. <coughs> You'd better go on sick call. Now, don't give me that routine about not sick enough or no time. Do you want to put all of us in the hospital with pneumonia? <coughs> Perhaps many of you consider these things too obvious for discussion. But there are still women in both army and civilian circles who don't know what symptoms of physical distress to take seriously, or vice versa. There are also those who moan and groan about vague aches and pains that they can't localize. One of the causes of their mysterious suffering that seems to evade their diagnosis 
but at the same time to invade every fiber of their bodies is unhappy feet. Unhappy feet can make a pessimist out of an optimist overnight. If you don't like to suffer, see that your shoes are properly fitted. Trust the judgment of the fitter as to size. She knows much more about your feet in the army than you do. And that applies both to your dress shoes and your little abners. Be sure to wear wool socks with these little abners. Don't wear the same pair of shoes each day. Change off until they are broken in and feel comfortable. A change eases your feet, even after your shoes are broken in. That means foot trouble. And so does this. First, sterilize the needle with a lighted match. Then prick the blister at the lower end. Just open enough to empty fluid from the blister. Don't remove the skin. Then cover the blister with a good sized strip of zinc oxide plaster and leave it on for several days. For corns or soft corns, report to your medical officer immediately. And be sure to report also if you think you have that painful fungus infection. Athlete's foot. Symptoms, a cracked skin, painful inflammation between or below the toes. Athlete's foot can spread to others as quickly as the seven years itch. The germ thrives on warmth and moisture, swimming pools and latrines. The first essential of good foot hygiene is to keep your feet thoroughly dry. Always dry your feet well and powder between your toes before putting on stockings. And here's another. Notice that she's cutting her nails straight across, not on a curve, to prevent ingrown toenails. Yes, it's most important that you treat your feet with special consideration and respect. Because now that you're in active service, you're using them much more than you ever did before. In fact, many of you have to learn to walk all over again. Most civilians don't know how, because they do so little walking. Usually they're carried to their destination. And when they're not going anywhere in particular, they stroll or dawdle. But in the army, I hear tell, you have to depend on your own feet to take you there. That's why learning to walk properly is so important. Carry your weight toward the outside border of the feet. Yes, your feet make for good posture. Your feet are the base from which you build your posture. Pushing off with your toes and walking from your hips will give you that 30 inch step without any strain. For if your knees snap back, your hips are going to protrude. Keep your knees straight, but relax. That's right, toes straight ahead, head up, bound to be if you keep your chest high. It may be an optical illusion, but your ankles do look slimmer when you walk the right way. From ankles to smile in one easy jump. You can't help noticing teeth when they're framed in such a smile. That's one very, very good reason for keeping them sparkling clean. But there are others. Last year, the Army Dental Corps drilled and filled 1,800,000 cavities. So you see, tooth trouble is also a common ailment among GIs. What causes tooth decay? Oh, a number of things, such as poor diet, not enough vitamins and minerals, too many sweets. If you eat before going to bed and forget to brush your teeth afterwards, particles of food lodge in the crevices and start to ferment. This encourages bacteria, and bacteria increase the tendency to tooth decay. That's why it's so important to brush your teeth regularly, and even more important to brush them correctly, from the gums downward or upward. Uh-uh. 
not from side to side, but up and down. Yes, that's right. Brush from the gum downward or upward. It does them good just to look at her. Yes, men are simple creatures. It gives them a lift to see a girl looking her most attractive on the job. Vital and freshly wholesome, with that natural glow that doesn't come in bottles and jars. Shining teeth, beautiful skin, for which there's nothing like a good scrubbing. Although to most of you it may seem too obvious to mention, daily bathing is the first must in the rule book for feminine attractiveness. The soap you use should be bland, particularly if your skin has a tendency to be dry. Deodorants and perfumes don't kill perspiration or other body odors. They only make them more offensive. Since many women are allergic to depilatories, shaving is still the most effective way to remove superfluous hair. If you use a facial cream or oil at night, be sure to remove the excess grease before going to bed. For that rosy bloom, a dash of cold water is the best astringent. And for chapped lips, use lip pomade or cream. Scalp lifting is in order to stimulate sluggish circulation. But for oily hair, do it in combination with an astringent. If you'll pardon the suggestion, a good brushing might be in order. Gently, gently. I didn't say scalping. And if you're looking for a change of hairstyling to suit your facial conformation and GI regulations, there's the page boy. the roll, the bun, the upsweep, The straight shingle. The curly shingle. If you wear your hair short, it should be cut and shaped often. Snip away the hangovers from the last permanent. I'm no expert on the problem of makeup. Since the proper use of cosmetics is an art in itself, we'll shift the scene to Hollywood and let an authority on beautifying feminine faces show you how to make the most of your face. Never use makeup as a mask. Use it to bring out, not to hide the natural freshness of your skin and use it conservatively. Makeup goes on smoother looks more natural with a foundation cream or liquid. It provides a lasting makeup and protects your skin against wind and sun. The wrong use of rouge can make a woman look hard or clownish. Cream rouge is applied directly over the foundation. Dry rouge is used only after powdering. To be effective, rouge and powder should not be detectable. Never use too much rouge. You can always add more, but you can't cover it. The application of rouge depends on correct placement. Cream rouge should be applied with the fingers and blended until no line of demarcation is noticeable. Never use an elongated field of rouge on the oblong face. Always use a circle. 
Never use a circle on the round or square face. Use an elongated field to create the illusion of length. When in doubt for placement of rouge, smile and place it on the highest point of the cheek. One should always choose a powder that gives warmth and brightness to the skin. In powdering, start at a receding point, such as under the eyes, hollow cheeks, or receding chin. Never powder a large nose first. It will become a highlight. Don't try to improve on nature with one of those thick Ubangi mouths. Follow the natural line of the lips. And don't use exotic lip shades. They're not chic and they're certainly not GI. Bite gently on a piece of tissue to set the lips and remove excess lipstick. Lipstick smears on handkerchiefs and lipstick rims on cups are not appealing. Don't tamper with the natural line of your eyebrows. Your eyebrows, as nature made them, give expression and character to your face and are functional. They protect your eyes from strong light and dust. These are actually the only articles necessary for good nail grooming, especially when you're in the army. Fu Manchu talons are out when you wear a uniform, and so is exotic nail polish. If you use polish, see that it's conservative. learned a lot. See how smoothly and skillfully her makeup is blended. She can be proud of that job. And she certainly is proud of her uniform. And she keeps it in a condition to reflect that pride. The hang of your uniform depends not only on the fitting, but on what you have to hang it on. She's very careful about using dress shields to avoid perspiration, stains, and odors. And being fastidious, she never wears her undies more than once without laundering them again. She even sees to it that her dog tags are warm and well-dressed. Yes, by keeping yourselves and your belongings in perfect shape, you're showing the world and G.I. Joe that you're a mighty sharp looking lot. But more important, you're also showing them that efficiency, endurance, stability, and courage are by no means exclusively stag affairs. <laughs>